It's a mixed start to the trading day in Asia. We have a slew of monetary policy decisions there. Some China data also coming out later this week. The Taiwanese index is up half a percent. Wipro has announced the resignation of CEO Theory Delaporte from effect 6th of April 2024. We must not on the, on the Nifty break the low of 22,303, which was the recent low that we saw. Going by the way the Nifty Bank has uh, moved, either today or tomorrow we get to those fresh all-time highs. But just keep in mind, both the two stocks are trading at fresh 52-week highs. However, these stocks could be the stocks of the day. Next three months, I will be like to guide it, my new team and the old team how it can be like to strategically we go to growth of the next abundance. For the first trades coming through, 22,575 is where we are at. The demographic story is stronger here. And then I think the consumer trends in India are very exciting. Nifty has already made a new record high by crossing its previous levels of 22,619. It's trading at the highest point of the day. Q4, when we talk about the company in general, sees a seasonal pickup in sales. And in fact, this time around, they've managed to post a significant growth of almost 72% as far as the volumes are concerned for AC. Hopefully, we should be in a position to maintain names at the current level. On markets, they've come off from the highs of the day. The Nifty is off around 40 points from the highs. Well, that is the day so far, and it is a very good session for the broader, larger indices. 150 points is what we have on the Nifty. This is closing bell, last hour of trade coming up. We are coming to you from the CNBC TV 18 Moti Rosewall Studios. I'm Prashant with me. My colleagues Reema and Nigel. Guys, I good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. What a good day, right? Fantastic. A little bit of a wobble at about 2 o'clock. But we are making our way back up and record highs today on Nifty, mid caps and banks. Banks have finally hit that record high. I think it's a large cap heavy day, right? Because you look at the Nifty, the banks, the Sensex, all of them are doing well. But the mid cap index actually is doing a relative underperformance. And you look at the number of stocks that are declining, they're more than the number of stocks that are advancing. So yeah. it's a large cap heavy day yet again. As I, absolutely. And I think uh, that is, uh, you know, just to kind of quickly recap, uh, that's exactly uh, right, because it's large cap six banks. Uh, if you look at it, I mean, in uh, th that sense, because I mean, actually, even banks are underperforming what non banks are doing. But in any case, it's a, a pretty clear three quarters of a percent higher gain in the nifty. Bank nifty is in the, exactly in the middle of the range, right? From the high, if you take the high and the low, we are exactly in the middle, about 0.18% uh, higher. Supports, I mean, actually, uh, the trailing reversal stops, if you want to put, I mean, look at the 40-hour exponential average. For the Nifty Bank, that sends at 47,882. Uh, just sort of, you know, keep that uh, in, at the back of your mind uh, as you uh, look to sort of stay long on the market. Mid caps and small caps, I mean, flattish, so not very much. But of course, this comes on the back of, you know, last week when small caps did very well. Uh, and uh, if you want to look at sectors, it's largely real estate and autos. Uh, so we'll talk about both those sectors in greater detail. Lots of business updates are coming through, and of course we'll get uh, you know earnings will, which will kick off in full flow over the next couple of weeks uh, as well. Those are the two indices: autos and real estate. Rima. Well, on the way down, it's the PSU banks and IT. So the PSU banking index is down close to about 0.7 percent, and the Nifty IT index is down 0.2 percent. But in the PSU banks, it's not State Bank of India. So State Bank of India is actually in the green, but the rest of them are under pressure. But somewhere around 1.45, 2 o'clock, if you pull up the mid-cap index, there was a sharp decline seen uh, in the index. But from those levels, we have seen a bit of a recovery. But absolutely flat on the mid-cap index. And the advanced decline ratio is actually in favor of the losing side. So that will also come up for you. Well, that's right. Uh, well, let's uh, get straight to how should you position yourself in the fine lot of trade. Mitesh Tucker joins in to give us some strategies. Hi, Mitesh. Uh, it's been a good session, right, for the Nifty. The Nifty Bank, you know, it's been a little bit wobbly, but it's made fresh all-time highs. What are the levels you're looking at on both these two indices? Yeah. Uh, Nigel, I think, uh, good afternoon. I think, you know, uh, one, uh, the Nifty getting past 22,550 was the breakout, and that happened with the gap. Uh, I would expect 22,800, 850 as the minimum, 22,950 as the next uh, idea, because as we approach a round number, you will see some profit booking happening. And uh, once the bank nifty, I think, you know, starts getting past uh, the all-time highs of 48, 630, uh, then I think, you know, and stabilizes over there, then I think, you know, you might uh, see more strength, I'm waiting for that to happen. Uh, till then, uh, I have a buy on HDFC Life. Uh, keep a stop uh, below levels of uh, 622, look for targets of 660 here. And a buy on NMDC with a stop at 218 for targets of 235. 
Okay, the Nifty headed to at least 22,800, 850, and those were some individual ideas. Let's now go across to uh, Sonia for more on Exide. Now, Hyundai Motor and Kia Corp have signed an accord with Exide Energy Solutions. Uh, what's the importance of this? Why is Exide surging? Sonia joins in. Sonia. Well, this is a big, big positive for Exide and more importantly for the signal that it gives to the entire industry about opening up of manufacturing of battery cells in India itself. Now, what's happened today is that Hyundai and Kia have signed an agreement with Exide Energy Solutions, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of Exide Industries. This is an agreement for electric vehicle battery manufacturing in India. Now, with this, Hyundai and Kia plan to localize uh, the manufacturing of uh, batteries and which will help them bring down the cost and eventually sell cheaper uh, EVs in India. But the focus is going to be on lithium-ion phosphate cells and they are aiming at expanding their battery development, production, supply and partnerships in the Indian market. Now, this is a big positive for Exide because earlier the assumption was that um, you know OEMs would do the cell manufacturing in-house itself. But now, with Hyundai and Kia giving the order to Exide, it opens up the doors for many other global OEMs to partner with battery manufacturers in India for uh, electric vehicles. In fact, Ilara Capital and Morgan Stanley have positive notes. Ilara is positive. They say this is a big positive surprise. Expect multiples to get re-rated upwards. While Morgan Stanley also has an outperform. They say that, you know, this kind of lithium battery manufacturing involves higher capex, more technology, and hence it will pull in a lot of global brands, large brands. And this is a big positive for companies like Exide. Back to you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that. Dipan Mehta, Director of Elixir Equities, is with us on the show. Dipan, you want to come in on Exide? Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you for having me on your show. I think it's a big development for Exide. But, you know, then the technology has to be tested because typically I think, uh, uh, you know, Exide has not had such a great track record in terms of developing new technologies and managing the lithium-ion technology and getting the manufacturing and the quality right also. Uh, these are challenges and this uh, the order is more into the longer term future uh, because the plant I think is still under construction. So while it uh, I think uh, it certainly shows that there are external players who have validated Exide's uh, strategy as far as uh, electric batteries is concerned, but implementation is going to be the key factor. And you know beyond that, I think I just want to wait and watch to see how the implementation falls uh, goes through and then actually see the revenues and profits before making a call on Exide. For the time being, I think it's just wait and watch. Okay. All right. Uh, well, uh, you know, let's uh, focus on another segment then that's uh, buzzing around. But I think we'll get to that in just a bit. I just want to focus some of these metal stocks that are seeing some buying from lower levels. Nalcom, it was a little bit lower. That stock has now recovered. It's almost at the high point of the day. So keep an eye out on that one. Infa is another one, you know, ferrochrome player. So aluminium, ferrochrome, those prices in the last 30 to 45 days have seen a big uptick. And that's why some of these stocks are getting bought into. Infa has gone ex-dividend, so it's actually 15 rupees has already shaved off the stock price. But yet it's moved up. So Indian Metals and Ferro Alloy should come up for you. Vedanta as well is holding with a gain of close to under percent and a half. And remember, these stocks have already seen a big, big run. And now, in fact, they're still seeing some buying. So the street is clearly positive on a couple of uh, metals like ferrochrome, like aluminium as well. For uh, copper, there's only one play, which is Hindustan Copper. But I think we can go across to Sonal, who's standing by to tell us about all those real estate stocks that are buzzing in trade. Sonal. Well, yes, it's a long list and the quarterly updates and some news piece as well that I want to talk about. Let me start with Godrish Properties because the company has informed uh, the exchanges that they've been able to sell 1,050 sto uh, units in a new project in Gurugram, which totals to around 3,000 crore rupees in terms of pre-sales. This is their most successful ever launch in terms of value and volumes. And in FY24, the Gurugram market has recorded a growth of 473% on a YY basis. The other new project in Kandavili also has seen growth of or sales of around 2,000 690 crore rupees in the quarter gone by. This is the Mumbai market I'm talking about. Signature Global is the other one. They have exceeded FY24 guidance in terms of collections and pre-sales. Their pre-sales are up 240%, volumes are up 111% and collections are up 71% and this is the quarterly number that I'm talking about. For Keystone as well, it was a good sequential recovery. Uh, in terms of collections, YOY there was a dip but otherwise it's a decent set. 
Pre-sales are up 37%, collections are up 48% and volumes are up 3% on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis for the company. India Bulls Real Estate, that's the big fundraise that we are talking about. Via preferential issue, the company has been able to raise 3,911 crore rupees and some big names here as well. The MBC Group has invested 1160 crore rupees, Bailey, Gifford and Company 209 crores, the Blackstone Real Estate Fund has put in 1235 crore rupees. Other investors, the likes of Quant Active Fund, Poonawala Finance, Microlabs, Maybank, Utpal Shade and Capri Global, they have invested close to 1243 crore rupees in the company. Uh, they've also announced acquisition of four projects amounting to 1853 crore rupees in terms of cash. Now, Prestige says that the latest in terms of quarterly updates, they have recorded their highest ever yearly sales and they've exceeded the guidance of 20,000 crore rupees in terms of yearly sales that they had given earlier. Uh, quarterly, their sales are up 21%, their volumes are up 3% and collections are up 26% as well. I uh, just took uh, stock of all the quarterly updates that have come by. Prestige leads the list with 21,040 crore in terms of sales, which is followed by Macrotech. Then you have something like a Signature Global. Then there's Sobha, Purvankara and Keystone are the other ones which have reported, reported numbers. Okay. All right. Uh, got that. Thanks a lot uh, for that, Sonal. Uh, Deepan, what do you make of this? Uh, the real estate players, uh, Sonal highlighted a few of them. What's your view? Yeah, the juggernaut keeps on continuing and really surprising that at relatively high base, these companies are able to generate these kind of sales and clearly I think the street and analysts may have underestimated the demand which is underlying in the industry. Uh, I think that these numbers also which will come through for the fourth quarter will be exceptionally good. And valuation-wise, these companies, real estate companies are pretty reasonable. Uh, and the important thing though is that we are valuing them on a net asset value. And although based on a trailing 12 month of the last available report, these companies are trading at or around the net asset value. What is really surprising is that every quarter after quarter, they're increasing the net asset value on account of new projects which they have undertaken. So generally positive on real estate stocks, uh, but you know it's a tricky industry. And uh, one should watch these uh, high momentum numbers quite closely because it doesn't take much for the industry to have a minor downturn, even in the longer run uh, bull market. Mm. Uh, Dipan, what about Voltas and the Q4 update? Uh, they've seen a significant volume growth of 72% in AC sales in Q4 and 35% for the full year. I think 2 million units is what they've sold last year. Now, considering Volta suffered with market share loss in the preceding quarters, a few quarters back, do you think, uh, you know, this, you know, Voltas is now a stock to buy because they may have addressed and their market share could start increasing from here on? See, Rima, you know, Voltas has been a big laggard, you know, and uh, not only just has it lost market share, but volumes also are quite tepid. And actually, industry as a whole, last couple of years, for some reason or the other, has not, not performed up to street expectations. But I think this quarter, this year, seems to be very good for the sector as a whole. But look at the valuation of Voltas. I think it's trading at extremely high price to earnings, price to book, price to sales multiple. And uh, these are not businesses which have got very high operating leverages or high operating profit margins. So while you may expect a good number from Voltas and clearly there's a trading rally underway, I'm not sure about the longer term prospects of Voltas. In fact, we are slightly more bullish on a company like Amber Industries, which clearly benefits from the government's PLI. And they're getting into many other uh, micro markets within the AC industry, like you know uh, uh, providing air conditioning for coaches and also other such uh, you know niches which they are exploring. In my opinion, I think Amber Industries can have superior growth rates compared to some of the likes of Voltas or Blue Star or the other listed AC players. Mm. <clears throat> Deepan, hi, good afternoon. Uh, any thoughts on uh, IAFL Finance? I mean, 13% on Friday, another 8% today. And from the lows of 350, it's it's up 100 rupees, basically. Uh, now, of course, that uh, the, the it, it halved because of the RBI action and... I'm assuming people, some at least at the margin, are making the bet now that it'll get resolved. I'm not sure if there's any new information at the margin, at least not, not publicly disclosed, but any thoughts here? IFL. Yeah, good afternoon, Prashant. The stock is cheap, there's no denying that. It was cheap even before the news came about RBI action on the gold loans. And uh, assuming that is able to somewhat maintain its growth rates, or even if there's a 2, 3, even a 5% decline in growth rates, the stock certainly is trading at attractive multiples. The management is extremely aggressive when it comes to growing the loan broke, but then we've seen what happened in the gold loan uh, segment for this company. 
Uh, let's just wait and watch what happens on the regulatory front. When it comes to banks, NBFCs, I think more and more, I feel it's important uh, to go into the larger cap banks and the larger cap NBFCs. They've anyway started moving. We have seen good price action movement in the likes of HDFC Bank and Bajaj Finance as well. And I feel from a longer term perspective, considering the risk return profile, I would like to have larger exposure to the large cap banks and NBFCs than some other smaller or small cap or mid cap NBFC like IFM. Dipan, the sectors that I track, you don't like them too much. <laughs> but uh, stock prices are going berserk, right? What do you think? Time to jump into one of them or you say, no, no, there are plenty of other options over there. This is too tricky. At some point of time, Chinese supply will reopen or demand will get soft and anything can happen from the Fed. So you still want to stay away. No, you know, Nigel, you'll be surprised. I, I, a very res respectable voice I was reading has said that, you know, he's expecting a super cycle in commodities. Mm. And, you know, if you have this, if you get the cycle right, then there's great uh, profit opportunity. There's a great trading opportunity. And, you know, I think that Vedanta is, you know, something which is quite interesting, you know, because if they split, the, if they are splitting the company, and then thereafter, they will do some m &A action over there, whereby the biggest overhang in the stock, which is the loan in the promoter holding, they will do something to reduce it significantly. And global markets for such m and action or raising funding also is quite positive. And, you know, valuations in Vedanta are really at, uh, at, I mean, complete knockdown valuations. So if you want to have a contrade in play uh, with a, like a one-year view, I think this is a company which is uh, worth, uh, worth watching. And one could take a small exposure to it, you know, but being very careful about, say, corporate governance issues or how this exact splitting, you know, actually takes place. Uh, because if they split the company, I think there's some value unlocking opportunity over there. You know, uh, Dipan, uh, we are at CNBC TV and I recall, uh, I think a month or 45 days ago, so we had put out this piece that Mr. Anil Agarwal, he's putting his hand out to Tango. But will someone dance with him? You know, because he's talking about not doing anything that will not be shareholder friendly. The stock has done very well because it is 250, 260, now it is 320. And besides that, what's working for them is the silver price move. There's only one listed player that you can play if you want to play the silver price move via Hindustan Zing. Margins are very, very high. So Vedanta is getting a tailwind from there. But as you said, the promoter entity in the past, they have flattered many times and then they've deceived. So we'll have to see whether this time around, Mr. Anil Agarwal and team, at the parent level, they're okay. And whether or not they'll deliver, but valuations work for them, as you mentioned. Appreciate you joining in, Deepan and uh, discussing all those stocks with us. Wishing you a good afternoon and a good uh, evening ahead as well. For the time being, we'll slip into a short break. On the other side, we'll be joined by Mr. Ajay, the Senior Vice President and Portfolio Manager at Frank Pillen Templeton. Stay with us. Welcome back. REC is under pressure. The stock is down 3%. They came out with their Q4 business update and they appear to have missed their full year guidance. Abhishek joins in with the numbers. Abhishek.
Well, it's a weak set of numbers coming in from uh, you know REC with respect to the business momentum. Uh, disbursers have declined uh, both YY and quarter on quarter. AM growth is also weak on a sequential basis, and as you mentioned, they have fallen short of their target. So they had a target of uh, 5.1 lakh crore plus in terms of AM, but they have uh, clocked in 5.09 lakh crore. Uh, disbursal to AM ratio is also a six-quarter low. That is how much of disbursals is going into AM. Uh, generally, we used to see anywhere between. 50% to 65%, but this time it's at 30-31%. So quarter on quarter, the loan growth is the weakest in last six quarters, coming in at 2.4% quarter on quarter. Last quarter, it was at 4.9% growth in Q3 FI24. Why, why the loan growth is the weakest in last uh, four quarters? It has come in a little bit uh, of more than uh, 17%, but in the previous quarter, that is Q3 FI24, the AM growth was 21%. Why, why? So sanctions are down 58.4%. Percent YOY and about 76.1 percent quarter on quarter. Disbursals have declined more than 15 percent on a sequential basis. AM growth is at just 17 percent YOY and two and a half percent on a sequential basis. Back to you. Okay, thank you very much for that. Moving on to stocks like Info Edge, the stock is up nearly eight percent. City has gone ahead and done a double upgrade. Nimesh joins in with the brokerage view on Info Edge and others. Nimesh. Well, you may know there are a lot of individual stocks which are buzzing on the back of brokerage. You know, so I'll start with InfoH first. That's been a big mover today, up 8 odd percent on large volumes as well. Uh, you rightly pointed out, you know, City has gone out and uh, doubled up with the stock to buy now, and they've sharply raised the target price to 6650. Now, of course, this uh, target price raise is, uh, is on back of roll forward as well. But the key reasons why they've upgraded the stock: one, uh, they believe that the recruitment business is likely bottomed out, and two, uh, largely they, uh, you know, the, they, they've raised the core uh, multiples for the core business. Uh, to now uh, 42x versus 30, 36x earlier. So that's been the reason why a, a double upgrade on InfoH and the stock up 8 percent. The second stock is Gale. It was part of my standard brokerage as well. The, the stock is a 5 percent and a big mover in the, in the FNO market. Uh, Morgan Stanley yesterday put out a large report uh, uh, and they've uh, sharply raised the target price there on Gale to 254. Now they believe that the market cap of Gale can double by, 20, uh, by 2026. And uh, they, they say that Gale is in a sweet spot because uh, there is the, the, the whole gas target is quite high at two and a half times, uh, and you know, by, uh, and the demand will go up by 2030. Uh, they also believe that monetization as well as the uh, you know chemical cycle uh, coming back would mean that the EBITDA can double uh, by 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 2027. So that's a big report from Gale, and that stock reacted five percent. The third stock is IRB Infra. Even that was buzzing on the back of a sales and note. Uh, they've raised the target price sharply. They do 81 rupees. Uh, you know, it's a, uh, the note very clearly says that quarter four has been eventful for IRB, uh, for IRB Infra uh, as, uh, you know, some of the catalysts are emerging. The first catalyst is uh, they won an arbitration award worth 1,700 crore. Uh, second, uh, there, was a, there was a litigation going on for one of the uh, tollway and that, uh, that uh, order has been reserved now. So that is expected in quarter one. That could be positive. And third, uh, the company has won assets worth $750 million. So put all together, uh, the, the CLSA believes that IRB is on a good runway, so there is a target price there. And the last is Shriram Pistons. That, even that stock is up, buzzing in trade, 8 percent uh, and, and got large volumes there as well. Uh, MK had done an uh, investor call with the management and some key takeaways, key takeaways which includes one, uh, strong growth visibility in the I, uh, IC business, so that's the first big trigger. Second, uh, the export, is, export market is going to grow up big time, so that will benefit uh, Shriram Piston. And third, uh, they're diversifying aggressively into the EV business. So, on back of all this, on the MK note, even Sri Ram Pistam is gaining 700%. Okay, well, Nimesh, so lots of action, right? This is the kind of market we like to report on uh, upgrades and uh, the market's responding very well to many of them as well. Ajay Argal is Senior Vice President and Portfolio Manager at Franklin Templeton. He's joining us now to take some questions. Ajay, good to have you with us here. Good afternoon, Prashant, this side. Uh, thanks uh, for joining us. Uh, so just give us an overview, Ajay, in terms of you know, uh, what's, what's, how are you, what's the lay of the land uh, for, in, in terms of what the market's done and uh, what you've been doing and, uh, and, and, and uh, basically where do you see opportunities, uh, themes and sectors where, you know, some of your ideas are coming now, incrementally speaking. Yeah, so as we all know, the markets have done very well in the last uh, financial year. Um, uh, and we have seen that uh, within that the pockets have done even better. So uh, large caps uh, basically look at Nifty, then they've done reasonably well uh, in terms of about 25-30% return if you look at the full financial year. And uh, of course the mid cap and the small caps have outperformed them by a very big margin. 
And within that, I mean, if you look at pockets like uh, PSU, that they have done even better, and uh, uh, that that our performance is something like 70% during the financial year. Uh, so uh, there are pockets of the market which are uh, reasonably valued, and we think that uh, that pocket is the large caps. So if you look at the Nifty valuations, they are about uh, 20 to 21 times uh, uh, one year forward multiple. Uh, which is kind of broadly in the range of the last uh, 10 year averages. But when you look at uh, the uh, valuations for the mid and the large caps, then the valuations are a bit on the higher side. So the mid caps are trading at around 25 to 30% premium to the nifty, which is uh, typically uh, the peak uh, relative valuation which they trade at. And there is very less uh, point of time when they trade at anything more than that. And similar is the case with the small caps. So right now our focus uh, is, and we are getting more ideas uh, in the large caps uh, and our, if you look at our diversified funds like uh, uh, Focused or FlexiCap, we are more tilted towards uh, the large caps. Uh, in terms of the specific pockets of the sectors where we uh, are getting uh, incremental ideas, uh, so we continue to see that uh, uh, banking and financial services is one broad pocket where the uh, ideas are still coming in terms of growth versus valuation. So the growth is reasonable, though it is slightly slower than the last year, but still it is in the ballpark of 13 to 14%. And at the same time, it is the only sector where the valuation is lower than the last uh, five or 10 year averages. So that combination of growth versus valuation is uh, the best in this sector. Though, as we all know that this sector has underperformed in the last one year and we had been uh, positive to that extent, uh, we were slightly early, but we think that uh, given where the market is currently, given where the other sectors are, this sector is where uh, you can look to uh, uh, kind of get uh, in incremental returns. Another pocket which has opened up is uh, the real estate sector. And in the real estate sector, the cycle is playing out very well. So we had a long period of 10 years where the real estate prices did not go anywhere. But uh, in the last one, one and a half years, so that has started picking up. Uh, and the reason has been that it, during the last 10 years, because the real estate prices didn't go anywhere, uh, the uh, the affordability improved. And therefore, uh, there, there was a lot of pent up demand and that pent up demand is now coming into the market. And at the same time, uh, all the developers have strengthened their balance sheet and they are coming up with uh, uh, last size launches and they are showing good uh, uh, pre-sales and uh, therefore the sales would follow. So there the growth uh, opportunity is uh, very large and the cycle has just started. So we are seeing some opportunities there as well. Mm. You're saying the real estate cycle has just started, Ajay, because, you know, stocks have, you know, double, tripled in some cases. Yeah, so what I meant was the cycle. So cycle has started about 12 to 15 months back. And obviously, as we all know, the stock uh, start discounting the cycle uh, a bit in advance. So to that extent, uh, maybe uh, maybe another six or nine months of uh, good cycle is already discounted even from here. But typically, the real estate cycles, uh, they go for three, four, even five years. So in that sense, we think that uh, there is still uh, uh, some scope left in terms of the cycle. Okay, all right. Uh, hi, Ajay. Uh, good afternoon and good to see you in. Nigel on this side. You know, two hi, sectors Nigel. that have done very, very well uh, this this year so far. One is pharma and one is metals, you know, from opposite sides of the spectrum. Uh, you know, metals could be that rebound in China, but pharma after doing nothing much for four or five years, that started 2024 in style. What's your view on both these two sectors? Yeah, so the pharma is uh, definitely uh, because of uh, the improvement in the business conditions. Uh, so if you look at the U.S. generic uh, market, which is, uh, had been a very competitive uh, space in, in terms of the pricing. And uh, if you go back uh, about 12 months or so, the U.S. generic pricing was falling uh, into double digits. So basically more than 10% was the fall year on year for maybe three, four years before that. And what has happened is in the last one year or so, the U.S. generic pricing, the fall, the pace of the fall is reduced. So we are falling at less than maybe 5% or so. So to that extent, uh, the the profitability of uh, the companies which are catering to the U.S. generic uh, piece has improved. And that has led to a general buoyancy uh, in, in the valuations and the expectations of the entire sector. Now, what we uh, approach uh, the sector is in terms of trying to find out niche opportunities within that. Uh, so we are not uh, so keen on the plain vanilla generics uh, in, in the U.S. pharma space. 
So uh, typically in our portfolio, you will find that there are companies which are either catering to complex generics or uh, who are catering to, let's say, the speciality pharma, which is a, a entire different space uh, from the uh, plain vanilla generics. And also in the uh, in the in the domestic market, uh, the growth remains very strong. And we have seen that one or two large companies uh, also came up uh, with their IPOs, which kind of uh, uh, led to a re-rating of the entire sector in the domestic pharma space. So any companies which are catering to that, either fully into the domestic pharma uh, industry or parts of it that, that have also got a uh, kind of uh, uplift in their valuations. So going forward, uh, the, the opportunity remains uh, quite robust, but the valuation, of course, as you have highlighted, are not so conducive now. So one, one will have to be more choosy, but this is still a space uh, we are positive <clears> on. Uh, and we are primarily positive because uh, uh, we, we focus on the differentiated uh, uh, companies. As far as the metals are concerned, uh, again, as you highlighted, that, uh, that there is a bit of, of expectation of uh, China rebounding. Uh, and at the same time, if you look at the Indian companies, uh, they've been able to uh, uh, kind of control their costs well. And uh, the Indian uh, domestic market also has... Uh, being generally having uh, prices which are uh, better than import pa parity prices. Uh, there was a premium, though that premium has now reduced uh, quite substantially. Uh, but still, uh, there is kind of uh, a bit of uh, protection for the uh, domestic uh, 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 steel industry, definitely. And uh, some yeah. of these uh, companies in the industry are very, very uh, uh, strong in terms of operational parameters uh, and having uh, very low costs. So, uh, the the opportunity is uh, reasonable, but uh, I mean it is a cyclical sector, so you cannot have very large weightages, or you cannot continue with them for very long. Right, uh, because of the cyclicality. Ajay, you know, uh, you started by saying mid cap, small caps are uh, sort of trading at ex are expensive. Uh, could you tell us uh, a what? To your mind is uh, what's the cutoff for uh, mid cap, small caps, and b what? In your portfolio, right, uh, what is the proportion? A fund manager I was talking to earlier was saying that if you ask me if mid-caps and small-caps are overvalued, I would say yes. But that is only because I can't, I can't give you a 30-minute nuanced answer because the, the, the space is so large, right, and is, uh, is very dispersed. So when we look at the index valuation, it, uh, it, it kind of reflects overvaluation in certain pockets, but there is a, a long tail of companies which perhaps is not very expensive. So just wanted your thoughts there. Yeah, so I kind of partly agree with it. Uh, the the mm. part which I don't agree with is the long tail. There is a tail, mm. but the tail is not long. Uh, so uh, I think uh, if I recall correctly, if you look at uh, the Nifty uh, mid-cap index, uh, which is uh, basically the Nifty 150 mid-cap index, uh, if my memory serves me right, about 25% uh, of the stocks there are trading at a multiple of uh, greater than 60 times one year forward earnings. And about half of the stocks there are uh, trading at a multiple of greater than 40 times one year forward earnings. So basically, large part of the uh, mid cap uh, index, if you look at the mid cap 150 index, which is the uh, benchmark for all the mid cap funds in the industry, uh, then half of them is uh, trading above a uh, uh, multiple of more than 40x. That doesn't mean that there, are, there aren't any enough opportunities at all. There are opportunities, but the opportunities are very limited. And so it's all about numbers. So the opportunities are much more in the larger caps is uh, what I want to highlight. Uh, on your question uh, with respect to how much weightages do we have, as I highlighted, uh, if you look at our, uh, our uh, uh, flexi cap strategies, uh, basically the flexi cap fund and the focus fund, uh, we are having about 70 to 75% in the large caps and the remaining into the mid and the small caps uh, put together. And just to give a uh, sense, uh, I think uh, generally also, uh, if you look at the entire market, about 70 to 72% is coming from the large caps. Large caps, when I say, it, uh, I mean, large, mid and small caps, when I say it is as per the SEBI definition I'm talking about. So 70 to 72% of the market cap is uh, within the large caps and the remaining is uh, within the mid and the small caps. So we are not too far away from that, but we are definitely... Uh, not overweight on the mid and the small caps. Uh, that gives us a good sense, Ajay. Uh, we'll uh, leave it there uh, for now. Thank you very much for joining us uh, with that perspective and hope to see you more often here on the program. 
on CNBC. Thanks indeed. Uh, well, Ajay Argal, uh, Senior Vice President, Portfolio Manager at uh, Franklin Templeton, uh, coming through there. Well, IT major Wipro has announced the resignation of his uh, sort of CEO, uh, Thierry Delaporte, who was uh, in that position for the last four years. He'll be replaced by Wipro lifer and insider Srini uh, Palia. Rima has now walked across to the wall and uh, she can explain some of this and what the street is <coughs> making of it. Rima, over to you. Thanks so much for that. Well, it comes in as a bit of a surprise. Wipro has announced the resignation of the CEO, Thierry Delaporte, with effect from 6th of April 2024. He will be replaced by Wipro veteran and insider Srinivas Palya as the new CEO and managing director, effective immediately. That said, Thierry will stay on till the 31st of May to ensure a smooth transition, but he does step down before his five-year term comes to an end in July 2025. Now, who is the new CEO, Srinivas Palya? He is a Wipro veteran and an insider. He's been with the company since 1992, which means more than three decades. And in his tenure, he's held many leadership positions, including the president of Wipro's consumer business unit, global head of business application services. And most recently, he's been the CEO of the America's One region, which is Wipro's largest geographic unit, contributing 31% to its revenues. Now, what's the street view on this? Well, for a change, Wipro has opted for an internal candidate. Remember the previous two CEOs, Abid Ali Nemuchwala and Theory Delaport were both external hires. Uh, Abid Ali Nemuchwala came from TCS. So Srinivas Palya, being an insider, it gives him a head start compared to what any other external candidate would have had. And therefore, in that sense, it's a bit of a positive. But the company has had its fair share of CEO churn and the company struggled under the various CEOs. And therefore, the street is going to be watching out for the turnaround strategy. Is there going to be a change in this strategy? For instance, will they continue to focus on consulting, which theory did? So that's going to be an important watch point. But the assumption is that the recovery is going to be gradual. That said, any new CEO, whether it's internal or an external, his job on hand will remain the same. One is revived growth. Now, Wipro's growth rate has faltered compared to that of the industry, not just in FY23, but even in the preceding years under the different CEOs. In fact, in FY24, in the first three quarters, the company has reported a negative revenue growth. So reviving growth, getting back to industry growth rate, the revival of Capco, which has been hit on account of the macro pressures, the discretionary spending coming down, is going to be very crucial and also stemming attrition. The company has seen a slew, a spate of high-level, senior-level exits. This list is not exhaustive, but you know, the recent two, the most high-profile ones were the CFO, Chief Growth Officer, all stepping down in the last six months. Now, all eyes are going to be on the new CEO as he takes charge. In fact, CNBC TV18 has accessed an email written by him, Srinivas Palya, to his employees, and this is what he had to say. Our core purpose remains supporting our client's success. I will be a relentless advocate, urging us to focus on execution, embrace bold ideas, and take calculated risks to propel us forward. Together, let's craft the next chapter in Wipro's story, building upon the strong foundation led by those who came before us and shaping the future of technology and business for generations to come. All right, uh, Rima, thank you very much uh, for that. So that's a pretty comprehensive look at what uh, the Wipro uh, change perhaps may mean going forward, at least what the stated intention really is there. We'll take a quick commercial break here. We'll uh, come back with uh, markets, which are doing fine, 150 points higher. Get you a check on what's happening in dealing rooms and D-Street chatter with Nimesh. And of course, some trading ideas here again with a technical expert. Stay with us.
Welcome back. Well, Oil India has slipped a little bit in the last few minutes. So I think we should pull up Oil India and even Indian hotels. Just pull up both those two stocks. Uh, they have moved to the low point of the day. But it's around 3 p.m. and it's a time where we get in Nimesh to help us out with what's going on in D Street Chatter. Nimesh, take it away. Hi, Rajul. A very strong day for, for the markets, largely led by large cap. So I guess the flows would be quite strong. Uh, and the, today the flows are largely dominated in the large cap name. So that's the overall feedback. A bit of profit booking in the, in the broader market stocks and within that, I think it's a mid-cap IT which has seen some bit of profit booking today. But uh, I was talking to a lot of dealers and, and the sense I'm getting is that there is this momentum uh, ahead of the results which, which can continue. And maybe a, a one or two days of consolidation and again, but you'll see uh, the mid-cap index uh, you know, coming back and, and the momentum is likely to continue in, in the, in the mid-cap stocks. Okay, all right, Nimesh, but what about individual stocks? What are you picking up? Well, so in, t in terms of individual names, I'll start with Adani Ports first. There's a large block deal uh, and, and, you know, Again, just to clarify, uh, uh, the non-promoter entity was a seller in today's block deal and not the promoter entity. So, some institutional investors have bought, but that stock was largely under pressure throughout the day on the back of that large block. So, that's the first name. Second stock is India Cements. While the, uh, some bit of uh, you know, traction seems to be back in cement stocks, I think India Cement is buzzing largely on buy flows. Plus, there is an expectation that maybe the company is likely to raise funds by selling some land bank. So, that's the trigger in uh, India Cements. The third name is Bandhan Bank. It's been in the news. We saw the reports of uh, uh, Ghosh uh, retiring early. But uh, at lower levels, there is, there is an interest back from larger h &I. So some bit of h &I interest is, is back and they've bought as well, is what I understand, in Bandhan Bank today. And the last name is Electronics Mart. Uh, again, the stock is buzzing off late, but I understand there's going to be a large block deal very soon. Most likely, the domestic uh, institutional investor is likely to, likely to sell in, in a block deal in, in, in Electronics Mart. Interesting list as always. Thanks very much uh, for that. Well, uh, Midesh is back with us to tell us what to buy or sell today for a reverse trade tomorrow. Midesh, what do you have? Yeah. Uh, Prashant, I think, you know, very clearly, given the fact that Nifty is growing its trend, we'll take some BTSC calls. So, NTPC is a BTSC. Uh, keep a stock at about 359. Look for targets of probably around 367. The other one is Page Industries. BTSC here just started 34, 800 for times of 35. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Shares of Bandhan Bank are under pressure after news of Chandrasekhar Ghosh stepping down as the bank's MD and CEO uh, when his term comes to an end on 9th of July. In fact, earlier today, we chatted with Mr. Ghosh uh, on his surprise decision, the rationale and more. Listen in to an excerpt from that conversation. And 2015, I opened the bank. And up to 2018, if you see that the three years, and these are the three years, I have been developed the bank and keep that uh, people's trust on the bank to deposit, attract to the deposit. 22, 23, I recovered more or less in the 70% up, 80%, but not in my satisfaction has come on that achievement. 23, 24, I have been seeing that at a very fantastic way has been come as a business momentum. Sleepies has controlled. 2015, I opened the bank and up to 2018, if you see that the three years, and these are the three years, I have been developed the bank and keep that uh, people's trust on the bank to deposit, attract to the deposit. 22, 23, I recovered more or less in the 70% up, 80%, but not in my satisfaction has come on that achievement. 23, 24, I have been seeing that at a very fantastic way has been come as a business momentum. Sleepies has controlled. Market expert Anand Tandan is with us on the show. Anand, if someone holds Bandhan Bank, what's the advice? Well, obviously, there will be some challenge because of the change that has happened and that too suddenly. Uh, but it's the, you know, the thesis for holding it was the fact that it is going to is showing higher growth and the fact that they are changing uh, the kind of uh, product mix that they were having into more traditional banking that will continue to happen. I don't expect that to see a major change. Uh, overall, uh, you know, if you have been holding on to the bank, this is not necessarily a reason for you to be getting out. It's not as if there is any charge yet uh, that one is aware of which has caused this change, other than the fact, as the, as the gentleman said, uh, that he has been at it for a very long time and would like to move on. 
given the fact that he is continuing to remain and will be kind of guiding the strategy, uh, the operational details can perhaps be handled by others as well. Mm. Any thoughts on the big uh, winner today, Excite, a tie-up with that uh, sort of association with Hyundai and Kia, 18% now. I mean, that is a re-rating re just there. Anand? Well, that's true. I mean, uh, you know, I'm not been a great fan of Excite. I think, uh, you know, it has been... Uh, it typically, its numbers kind of uh, do worse than many of the other battery, some of the other battery competitors that it has, uh, and uh, it has often flattered to deceive. Uh, uh, of course, the tie-up does help, and you know, to that extent, there will be some increase in volumes, which perhaps justifies some of the move. But I would imagine much of it is in the price. Mm. Oh. Much of it is in the price now at 380 for Excite. Moving on, Voltas. That surged 8% following the Q4 business update. Very strong numbers. Vamakshi joins in with the details. Vamakshi. Well, very strong numbers indeed from Voltas. And as a result, the stock, in fact, uh, touched an all-time high today. Uh, in the fourth quarter, the company reported a significant growth as far as volumes are concerned for the AC segment specifically. The volumes were up almost 72%. Uh, in, and generally, quarter four is expected to be a seasonally strong quarter, but the volume growth was quite significant. Uh, for the entire year, sales of over 2 million AC units were reported, which is the highest not only for the company, but across all brands in India. Volume growth for the uh, entire year as a result stood at almost 35%. The company says that this stellar performance was largely driven by very strong demand for cooling units, very strong omnichannel distribution as well as some of the new launches that they did. Voltas Beko, which is the home appliances brand, also grew quite healthily, reporting a volume growth of almost 52% in the fourth quarter and the company now says that they will be gearing up to further expand its retail as well as distribution network. The, there was a channel check that was conducted by Prabhudas Liyadhar and uh, that channel check indicated that Voltas had taken a price hike of almost 2-3% to but despite that, the company has managed to gain the most market share after Daikin. So another positive trigger out there for Voltas. To sum it up, very strong show as far as volume growth is concerned. Positive triggers ahead and as a result, Voltas is surging in trade today. Thank you very much for that. Uh, with it, Blue Star is up 3.5% and another stock, EPAC Durables, is up close to about 6%. This is a company which manufactures ACs. It's an OEM, an original equipment manufacturer, for companies like Voltas, Daikin and many others. I think seven out of the large ten AC manufacturers get their ACs manufactured by EPAC Durables. So the strong numbers are reflecting in EPAC Durable. It's a recent listing. It's not done so well. The issue price was 230 so the stock is trading below its issue price of 230 But today, on the back of that Voltas news, EPAC Durable is up 5.5%. Anand, Voltas, uh, Blue Star, even EPAC Durable, if you look at it, all these are plays on, you know, AC man ACs and sales in India. Would you, do you like any of them? As you mentioned, it's seasonally the best quarter, obviously, because this summer you will have, and especially since it appears to be a rather bad summer for India, it, uh, it will obviously drive sales. But if you look at what Voltas has reported, you know, by little, likely double over the next 12 months in terms of its earnings, it is also halved, uh, you know, if you look back a couple of years. So it's not as if it's going to do anything spectacular from here. It is just going back to where it was in terms of profitability and profits, uh, where it was perhaps a couple of years back. Uh, you know, to see whether or not there is a substantial change, you have to wait to see whether it was just channel stuffing or whether there is actually an increase because the question is where are you uh, actually counting sales uh, from the factory or from the uh, retail? And I doubt very much whether it's uh, going at the retail level. So, you know, I would still wait for some, some more time. It's already trading at, you know, at, a, at the current years, 100 times, next year's 50 times, even assuming doubling. Uh, it's not as if it's a particularly cheap stock. Hmm. Hi, Anand. Good afternoon. What did your view on either of these two stocks? Because they are the biggest movers in this hour. Loris Laboratories has actually been a relative underperformer and it's been very, very volatile in terms of their guidance, in terms of the way the stock price has moved as well. That's now up close to 6%. There is some buzz that maybe they get a large order. So that's one stock. The other one is Torin Power. One day it's up 5%, one day it's down. More up than down, more often than not. But any view on either of these two? Well, Loris is, as you said, it has not been a great performer. But I think like most uh, uh, sectors, you know, since pharma is slowly coming back into fashion and has actually done reasonably well, 
it is uh, only right that Loris also actually begins to uh, show some signs of uh, strength. Uh, I think the global situation is looking quite positive for uh, pharma companies, especially companies like Loris, which uh, you know deal with uh, with some new molecules, etc. Uh, we are already seeing, for example, some upside post potential in uh, DVs, and uh, to that extent, Loris's chemistry has been uh, quite superlative in the past. So I wouldn't be very surprised if, uh, you know, what the rumors you're talking about actually were to come through. Uh, that said, uh, you know, it's, even without that, I would argue that it's among the cheaper or, you know, less over-owned stocks uh, in the pharma industry. And therefore, you know, if you wait long enough, I'm sure you'll make reasonable returns on it. All right, uh, Anand, you know, stay with us. We'll just come back. There's about 12 minutes to go for the market to close, uh, but we'll get you some sound bites. Now, this is the same busy TV and exclusive. Uh, the global... The Bank of America uh, has raised their target for S&P 500, the benchmark in the U.S., uh, to 5,400 from 5,500, uh, 5,000 earlier. We spoke with Savita Subramaniam, head of equity strategy, uh, U.S. Bank of America, about this and more. Listener. Our view is we're in, in for a, a broader recovery, um, higher highs on the S&P, but not necessarily from just tech, but, but you know, other companies. So rates, I think, are manageable for most companies in the S&P 500. And, you know, think about it. Tech companies have net cash in many cases. So they're actually making money in this environment. I think 12 to 24 months out, we start to see the productivity gains mm -hmm. of companies like Bank of America or other service companies um, using AI to become more labor light. I think it's fintech, it's legal, it's IT services, and we've already seen this transform certain industries. If you look at the US, the white collar jobs are, are maybe more in, at risk, but within the you know kind of broader American spectrum, what we're seeing is this reshoring boom. So, you know, we've we've had a, about since 2018, we've seen companies move property, <laughs> plants, and equipment out of other regions of the world, mostly China, back to the U.S. I mean, one of the things that we looked at was, you know, what is the level of real rates that will re really destroy the economy, mm -hmm. and. I don't think that we're there yet. I mean, in fact, in the 80s and 90s, we had higher real rates than where we are today. Yeah. And the market was doing well. Companies were focused on efficiency. So if we move back to that type of environment, I think that it could be a, a still a very strong environment for equities, for the economy, et cetera. I do think that the demographic layup, layout in India is much more attractive than in the US. In the US, one of the reasons that the labor market is so tight is that we have this aging population and the, the, you know, these early retirees during COVID. Um, so the demographic story is stronger here. And then I think the consumer trends in India are very exciting. Welcome back. We're in conversation with Anand Tandan. Uh, the Nifty Bank is up close to about 100 odd points. It's showing you a gain of nearly about 0.2% in percentage terms. Uh, it's come off a bit from the day's high. Early in the morning, the stock, sometime in the afternoon, mid-morning, uh, the stock hit fresh record highs. But from those levels, it's come off close to about 120 points off from the session highs. But still, Today, markets, uh, the Nifty Bank did hit a new record high. Anand, wanted to get your thoughts in on Nika. Nika is up close to about 6-7%. The Q4 business update looked good. Uh, do you like Nika? 
Well, I, if you were to look at what are the uh, you know entry barriers or the moat around the company, I think the only choice is the only question is that whether they'll be able to keep on bringing in new brands from overseas and uh, selling them here. I don't know whether that's an adequate moat, frankly. I think other companies, including in the uh, you know even regular companies like. Uh, 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 you know, like Amazon, for example, could actually create a premium product line and start selling from there as well. So I'm a little circumspect at buying it at uh, higher valuations. Uh, that said, their execution has been quite good. They have done uh, reasonably well in creating a niche for themselves. And to the extent that, uh, you know, there is a certain uh, uh, a market for that kind of product line, I think, uh, you know, they they have some runway ahead of them. There is, however, uh, you know, uh, different kind of business, which is a lot more broad-based, which is cheaper. And that is something that uh, I think can actually uh, turn up and become quite a competitor uh, going forward. So I would be a little worried in terms of where you are going to be buying it in, in terms of entering at a higher price. Mm. Anand, what about Z? You know, at around 150 rupees, what would your view be? There is a lot of uncertainty, but the stock has come off considerably. Now they're making all the right sounds. They're talking about cost cutting, you know, the... Uh, the man on top, Mr. Goenka himself, is taking a 20% cut. So they're making the right sounds, but I was reading a couple of sales notes. They're saying, first, we want to see action. Then we'll see how execution takes place, and then we we'll maybe could re rate the stock depending on what's left of the business. At around 145 to 150, your view? I think the downside seems to be a little less from here. However, the question of upside, as you said, is about how well they execute. Now, there are two issues with that. One is that, you know, in the past, for example, Z has suddenly said that we are putting up a few cereals and going to put up more than 200 crores, uh, which is somewhat inexplicable because, as you are aware, you know, even if you do a long-term series, you don't make the whole series up front. You make a few episodes and see how it goes. So the thing that you are going to put up a large amount of money because you are building up the inventory for, uh, for many hours of programming just doesn't, uh, didn't cut it. Uh, whether they go back to that kind of behavior is a question. The second is, of course, the, a lot more fickle problem of trying to get the consumer taste. Uh, today, the consumer has a huge number of choices, and therefore, it's not so easy to predict what it is that will sell. I mean, you can see that in many of the movies that are coming through, that despite having a top-rung uh, you know, artists, etc., uh, the stories are not clicking enough to be able to light the fires behind companies which are in the distribution business. So by and large, I think, you know, you are going to find a little bit of a challenge. The fact that they would have had a good tie-up uh, would have actually given them a lot of marketing clout and being able to raise the advertisement across various channels. That has not happened. So I think they will find it a little bit of a struggle. So I don't see much downside from here unless they get into financial trouble. But otherwise, on the upside, uh, like I said, you have to wait and see how the programming actually shapes up. Mm, maybe, I mean, yeah. Uh... The downside perhaps is limited, but upside perhaps will uh, depend on uh, what they do, right? I mean, so uh, will people be willing to make that bet uh, just with the downside limited cap? We'll see. Uh, on, uh, on, on on Info Edge, uh, Anand, which is Nokri, any thoughts here? Do you think, uh, you know, there is, it's of course a play on IT services, etc., but it's also got that investment in Zomato, right? Which of course has done very, very well for them, Info Edge. Uh, just your thoughts. So, on the, so I would think of the investments as separate from the uh, business, right? If you are looking at the investments, it's a let's think about it like a closed uh, a closed ended fund. Why would no closed ended fund trades at a premium to its underlying investments? So you should actually be looking at a discount value on the overall uh, investment part. Same thing goes for any holding company. You look at the holding company's discount; they are as strong as 40, 50 percent. So there is no particular reason that you should not be putting the same kind of discount. So that's not really the, so you could, should take it out from the share price rather than looking at it uh, as part of the business. If you were to do that, you will find that the stock's not particularly cheap. Uh, the earnings itself, as you mentioned, is now driven largely by uh, IT, uh, marriage, uh, you know, your uh, real estate and so on. Out of this, only uh, marriage is a steady business. They don't have the best market share there. Uh, real estate is definitely firing, and but they don't make money there. So the only thing you're really looking at is the IT and related areas. Now, IT and related areas are the one part which are a little bit dubious in terms of the kind of growth we are looking at. Though one can argue that you should be looking at uh, some of the IT companies because they have underperformed. Uh, the reality is that, again, you take a company like TCS, trades at 28 times P, 
Google trades at 22 times. I mean, why would you want to buy TCS at 28 if you can get Google at 22? Is the moat better in uh, TCS versus Google? I'll leave it for you to, un to answer that. So I am not particularly excited with the IT business in the sense that, yes, you should hold it in your portfolio as a placemaker, assuming that there is a problem. It is not likely to uh, go down as much. Therefore, it will outperform. But in a, a raging bull market like we are in, it's also not likely to give you, a, except episodically, uh, not likely to give you big upside. So a der derivative of that, which is what InfoAge is, uh, you know, has to see some lots of other growth areas other than IT in terms of recruitment for it to make the cut. Any real estate stock that you like? The Q4 updates seem to be quite solid. Well, I like to play the real estate through the housing finance companies. They are less uh, volatile. They are also less difficult to forecast. Uh, you know, the numbers, of course, are not going to be anything, anything great. You take LIC housing, for example, you are likely to get a small margin contraction, etc. It's a highly competitive market. But the underlying demand for IT, uh, for real estate itself is a little hard to predict. And while we've seen a big uh, upside over the last couple of, uh, of last few quarters, I would argue last maybe five or six quarters, I think, uh, you know, the kind of pricing that you are beginning to get to, except if the market were to remain extremely bullish and people make lots of capital gains, I think you will run into some kind of uh, uh, wall uh, fairly soon. So yes, on a long-term basis, housing remains a very attractive space, but I think you've seen much of the run in the near term already there in the price. All right. Uh, <clears throat> Anand, uh, we leave it there. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, running us through uh, what you're making of things. All told, I mean, the first day of a new week is uh, basically new highs uh, for at least three of the indices, Nifty, Midcap, uh, and the Bank Nifty, uh, seeing uh, and making fresh highs before coming off a little bit. But uh, good session. Uh, 22,662 is where the Nifty is uh, closed at. The Bank's uh, index up about 0.18%, middle of the range, by the way, for the Nifty Bank and the Midcap index, after making a high uh, in the morning, uh, ends absolutely flat. Uh, so there was a sharp sell-off on the Nifty Bank starting at about 120-ish or so. And uh, we never really went back uh, to those uh, levels uh, for the rest of the day. The small cap index, of course, also had a pretty quiet day. If you're looking for sectors where there was outperformance, it was autos. Three of the top uh, gainers on the Nifty are all auto names. And of course, there was real estate as we've been discussing. All those business updates coming through and some names doing very, very well. Prima. Uh, so, X of Autos, you also had strength in names like LNT, Reliance Industries, and Access Bank. These are three stocks which outperformed, and NTPC too was up nearly 3%. On the losing side, Wipro ends down nearly 1%, but even other IT names like LTI, Mindtree, TCS, HCL Tech ending mildly lower. Well, just one word, you know, in the final minute of trade, we have transformers and rectifiers. They came out with the setup numbers. It appears that the profit has come in at 40 crores that compares with around 9 crores. Mm. Explains why, you know, if you pull up the intraday chart actually of the stock, towards the end, there's a sharp spike up out there. Mm. It's already run up considerably. The sheet was anticipating good numbers, but it appears the numbers were as good. So if you just pull up the intraday chart, that'll give you a better like picture a rocket. on that one. Yes. I mean, uh, from 456, it ends at 30 rupee move, by the way. So that's a large move coming in on TRIL uh, in the last, I mean, actually, to start from in, in three minute. minutes flat, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, there you go. That's the one that we're talking about. So, yeah, lots happening. Uh, but it's a wrap on this edition of uh, <coughs> Closing Bell from all of us here. It's goodbye. Thank you very much for staying with us. Uh, but uh, Markets Forward will pick up on all the action in just a bit. Stay with us. <laughs>